please welcome to the stage the panel on next steps to address the crisis of missing and murdered indigenous people. Yes, I am live today and watching with enthusiasm online. Thank you, Secretary Vilsack and Indigenous chefs. I wish I could be there for lunch. I know that many of my colleagues have been and will be there with you today, and I'm so grateful for all they do for Indian Country. I'm honored to moderate today's White House Tribal Nation Summit panel on next steps to address the crisis of missing and murdered Indigenous people and to join this important conversation virtually with some truly incredible experts and advocates. Today's panel will highlight the progress that has been made and the work ahead to tackle this crisis alongside our partners, several of whom are on the stage today. This legacy of violence has left no community unimpacted. This panel is intended to elevate the perspectives of Native leaders and experts who are in the fight against this crisis and the violence that impacts Indian country every day. Since day one, the president and our entire administration have worked with tribes to develop policies reflective of the on the ground needs of law enforcement to reinforce tribal jurisdiction and ensure adequate resources are there to exert that jurisdiction and to develop and advance holistic, culturally informed action that disrupts systemic violence within our communities. Some of the initiatives we'll discuss today include the President's 2021 Executive Order on Public Safety and Justice and MMIP, the implementation of the Not Invisible Act, a law I was proud to champion in Congress, the work of the Not Invisible Act Commission, and the implementation of the Violence Against Women Act. Under President Biden's leadership, we are finally beginning to tackle the centuries-long epidemic that started when colonization first began. It is difficult, but necessary work, and together, we are making real, tangible progress. On today's panel, we'll hear from tribal and federal leaders and experts. We hope to also have time for question Q&A, and please know that we have our amazing interior staff in the room, and who also will be at lunch with you, and who are happy to speak with you further about this issue or any issue. It is now my pleasure to introduce our panel. Judge, and please, um, I am not there, so please raise your hand if you can, so I know where you're sitting. Um, Judge Michelle Demert, who serves as a Not Invisible Act Commission Commissioner, I'll call that NIAC, a NIAC Commissioner from the Central Council of Clinkett and Haida. Thank you for being here. Councilman Philip Williams of the Yurok Tribe, Thank you so much for being here. Sergeant Boz Windy Boy, who serves as an IAC commissioner and is also on the Yakima Nation Police Department. Kristen Welch, the founder and executive director of Waking Women Healing Institute and also a NIAC commissioner. Rosie Hidalgo, the director of Office of Violence Against Women at the Justice Department. It's nice to see you again, Rosie. Thank you for being here. Timothy Langan, Executive Assistant Director of Criminal Cyber Response and Services Branch at the FBI. And Allison Ramsdale, U.S. Attorney General for the District of South Dakota. We are so thrilled to have you all here today. And with that, we'll just get this conversation started. Question one is for our non-federal panelists, and I ask you to limit your remarks to four minutes each so that we um, have time for everyone. This is the question. Over the past year, the Not Invisible Act Commission held seven in-person hearings and testimonies to gather public comments from survivors, families, and relatives of victims of violence in Indian country. Just this month, the Commission submitted a report to Congress, DOJ, and DOI on the findings of the hearings and recommendations. Could each of you comment on your experience with and the importance of the Commission and what is needed to make the recommendations in this report a reality? And we'll start with Judge Demert. Thank you, Secretary Holland, and thank you for your hard work in getting the Not Invisible Act Commission Act passed when you were in Congress. We owe you a debt of gratitude. 
So that is an excellent question. We need a decade of action and healing our families and need answers and hope that the Not Invisible Act Commission will help effectuate real change. They it, trusted us with their stories. We shared these stories with Congress and the administration. Let's make the NIAC report matter. Let's act on all of our recommendations. Something is wrong when <clears throat> year after year, our Indian women are murdered at 10 times the national average, missing at high rates, and Indian women and children are sexually assaulted and trafficked at disproportionate rates. We matter, our families matter, our survivors matter. One of the Commission's most important recommendations is for the federal government to honor its trust obligations and provide sufficient funding to fully address unmet needs in tribal communities targeting the most critical public safety, criminal justice, health care, and victim service needs. We need meaningful financial aid, and we have proposals for how that can be accomplished. Some of it is just a simple redirection of funds. The U.S. spends billions each year to protect and preserve democracy and stop genocide across the world, but yet fails to provide meaningful aid or funding to American Indian and Alaska Native villages. The BIA publishes a yearly unmet need report to Indian tribes and Alaska village governments. The unmet needs are a fraction of the aid given to foreign nations. Our people are dying. The lack of public safety in our communities is a humanitarian crisis. We fit the definition. Yet the unmet needs identified in the BIA report fails, fails to make it to the president's budget or congressional appropriations for us, domestic dependent nations. Is this a breach of trust? Congress must pass legislation requiring DOJ and its sub-agencies, including the FBI, to submit an annual unmet needs report similar to what is required of DOI for the Tribal Law and Order Act. Let's compact DOJ funds rather than grants. Have DOJ make recommendations to Congress to provide for this recommendation. Other funding options? Restrictions in the Victims of Crime Act do not serve victims. A simple fix would be to uh, allocate 5% to Indian tribes to improve justice systems, infrastructure, and victim services, including but not limited to intergenerational and historical trauma. Simple. A new funding option, federal leasing of oil and minerals. We know these man camps and extraction industries prey on our women. The administration and Congress should require that a percentage of the revenue from these federal leases goes to fund public safety for Indian tribes. There are already studies by the FBI on this issue in the impact of mining and oil on our public safety. Gaming compacts could be used as a model for how to craft the language within these leases. For Alaska, we have never gotten meaningful, consistent tribal justice or public safety funding. Our land was given to for-profit corporations in the 70s. One recommendation is any village or regional corporation's taxes should be directed to a tribal justice and public safety fund. For the administration, we need a permanent Native Nations office at the OMB to help coordinate executive branch federal funding programs and policies, including those related to MMIP and human trafficking. Please appoint an Associate Deputy Attorney General in the United States Department of Justice to work exclusively on Indian laws and policy issues. We would welcome a strong statement from President Biden that builds on his 2021 executive order on public safety. President Biden, please, please declare a decade of action and healing for tribal nations and then challenge Congress to pass a resolution. These declarations will have force and provide a pathway to action, especially when you adopt our financing proposal with needs-based budgets. Goodness cheesh. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate that articulation of what needs to be done. We'll move now to Sergeant Wendy Boyd. Thank you, Secretary. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Baz Windy Boy. I currently serve as Sergeant in the Yakima Nation Public Safety, and I have 15 years' experience in law enforcement. <clears throat> Being appointed to the Non Visible Act Commission as a non federal member has been very 
special. They're, the inclusion of tribal law enforcement in a, non, not, in a federal commission has been very eye-opening to me and hearing other officers speak across the country has been <clears throat> a great way to understand that we all suffer from the same issues and the same <clears throat> lack of officers in our areas. So I, <clears throat> I currently cover a, well, I live on a 1.3 million acre reservation and I cover about a quarter of that. And we just recently hired 10 more officers, so I'm stretched pretty, pretty thin, including our, um, our seated, you know, our, our other areas that we cover as well. But it's, it just it show in hearing everybody else speak across the country, the other tribal law enforcement, and watching them and understanding that they, they are, they need the help, and they don't, they. They, it was special because they actually came out and they opened up to each and every one of us. Watching them speak to us about their mental health uh, and just how much stuff that they've been going through and living, living with, being an officer is, you know, I don't really think about it a whole lot, but there's so much stuff that we need to cover at our homes. There's so much that... <clears throat> that they just, they, I, it, they don't know how to express themselves. And I, I understand that. Like I, it was really hard for me to come forward today and open up about how everything works back home. So I, I could see what they're all going through. And hearing that they're all short-staffed, that we're all having a hard time, you know, just covering our basic areas, but then we're always, we'll always be there and no matter what. And that's what was really special hearing from each and every one of them. The chiefs that came forward in Albuquerque was really special and hearing what they had to say and then watching them band together when they had no, nowhere else to turn to was, it was nice. Like I, I didn't realize how, you know, how much how much need, like they need the help. So with our recommendations, we focused a lot on mental health for police officers in Indian country. Our second recommendation focused a lot on retirement and recruitment because there's a lot of us that leave to go to state agencies and federal agencies because they offer a retirement police officers, tribal officers don't get that option. I haven't got a retirement my whole career, and that's 15 years of work. <clears throat> it's all, it was also touched on it towards the end that we needed more female officers. There was a huge request for more female officers. But getting the, getting, getting, you know, getting females to be patrol officers is pretty hard. You know, I've, I've Definitely tried to get as many as I could back home, but it takes, a, it takes a special lady to do the work. There's a lot of stuff that we go through, a lot of stuff that we see, and to keep all that inside, you don't really realize how much you're carrying. So watching everybody go over how their agencies are ran and how they they never let it go. Like they, they keep it all inside and they're just holding on to it. And it was really special to watch that in Albuquerque. And I appreciate each and one of my fellow officers for doing that. Our third recommendation that we had rec uh, brought forward was, uh, it was included with uh, recruitment and it had to do with trying to cover education benefits, getting people in college interested in being law enforcement officers. And I know the BIA, had office, or the BIA director had touched on that some during our meet, so I'm kind of proud to hear that he is doing something to help that, with that. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of uh, feedback from officers. We're pretty, we're pretty straightforward, so I really look forward to hearing 
what the outcome is of all the work that we've done and the sacrifice of the time that we all made because we all did all of this work while doing our at-home jobs. Mm -hmm. And it was really important. That I'm really proud of these ladies and everyone else that was on the commission. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sergeant Wendy Boy. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for serving our country um, and appreciate your response. We'll go next to Executive Director Welch. Uh, Postal, for all my madams out there. Postal, I want to wait. Natamatam, Natakam, Apache, and Itotam, Kayas, Mamachi, Tok, Omat, Nomaneoik, Anishinaabe, Koyendao, Made, Koyendao. Um, I just want to say match for uh, It's an honor to be here um, speaking to all of our, our leadership here and being present with these amazing panelists. Um, I had a really hard time, like how do I condense this experience of what it was like being part of this commission? And I just want to thank all of our fellow commissioners, all of the leadership that made this happen, all of the people in the background, the facilitators, the writers, like we didn't do this alone. There was more than three of us. <laughs> There's an entire army of advocates and survivors and family members and federal partners that came to, together to make this commission work happen. Um, and, and honestly, my first response was, ah, that's what it was like. It was intense, it was healing, it was powerful. And it documented our survivors and our family members' truth. And I think that's the power of the report, is that it's not just a, a dead thing. It's a living, breathing document. And it's our families and our survivors' voices and stories within that document. And because of that, it is our responsibility to do everything we can to move those recommendations forward. We have incredible leaders in this room that can rally behind our survivors and our family members and say, we heard you, and we're going to make sure that this moves forward. And our federal partners as well have to carry that responsibility. We heard about the truth, the painful truth of what our survivors and our family members experience every day, that loss, that grief, and all of, so many of our families and survivors have to put that pain on hold and go investigate. They have to become boots on the ground search and rescue teams. They have to navigate the criminal justice system alone, as complex as it is. They have to become caretakers for the children that are left behind. And that's just a little snippet of some of the issues that our family members and survivors face. There is a mistrust in the system because it has continued to fail us over and over again. This is not the first time we're asking for these recommendations. Hundreds and thousands of advocates and tribal leaders in many reports came before this that are asking for the same thing. Stop causing the harm. There must be accountability for those that are causing harm and give us the resources because we know what to do. We have the solutions. The impacts of when we have relatives go missing and murdered is not a single pebble. It is an incredible ripple through Turtle Island. When a relative goes missing in Alaska, it's felt in our communities in Wisconsin because we all know that pain. There isn't a person in this room that doesn't understand that pain of the violence that our relatives are facing. We have to address those intergenerational traumas that are the impacts of this epidemic and the violence we're facing. There are too many of our relatives and survivors that turn to alcohol and drugs to numb the pain because the grief is too much. There are too many of our survivors that are homeless on the street because they can't get in because they either don't fit the checklist criteria or that shelter doesn't look and feel safe to them because it is not culturally founded. We need solutions that are created by us and for us and I think that was the important thing of this commission is there were survivors and family members at the center of the work and it has to continue to be that way when we implement these recommendations and move them forward. Some of those recommendations that we talked about is let's heal the root cause. We understand that, yes, we've faced incredible 
hardship and pain because of this epidemic and trafficking. But we are also incredibly strong and resilient. Our culture is the key that's going to move us forward. Our connection to culture has the ability to heal any wound, no matter how deep. And that's what needs to be at the foundation of our programs, of our services, and the way we think when we're implementing and developing programs. They must be founded in our culture. Another recommendation was that we need to increase access to indigenous social determinants of health. That is a public health and safety and justice issue. We need to increase safe and stable housing, and especially housing that is has the ability to care for the complex needs of our trafficking survivors and our families that are left behind. We need to take care of special needs populations and high needs populations and protect our youth. Think about our youth and the foster care system. We need to hold that system accountable for the harm that's causing and make sure when that our relatives come out of that foster care system, they are protected. They have access to housing, education, connection to culture, those social, indigenous social determinants of health. I don't think we can uplift that enough. It came up over and over and over again. Not just the pain was testified in those hearings, but the solutions were testified in those hearings. Healing and response teams. There's this beautiful, amazing uh, woman in Alaska from a coalition. She had the whole document. Here's a healing and response team that is a wraparound approach. It's going to focus on healing. It's going to provide systems navigators. It's going to provide resource liaisons. It's going to connect our survivors to all of the help they need in a holistic, culturally founded way. There are many solutions out there that have been rolled out already that are doing a great job, like the missing murdered unit. <coughs> and we know that we need that expanded. It's doing its work. Can, how can we increase that budget? How can we increase access to more agents? How can we give them the reach in PL280 territories and non-cooperative jurisdictions so that they can do the work that they need to do? We also wanted to uplift the 2023 MMIP regional program that was rolled out. That recommendation was to increase their budget in perpetuity. They are a liaison from the local level to the federal level, and it gives us teeth to move the things forward that we need moved forward. Give them the ability to do the work and make sure that they have the capacity to do it. One coordinator for a region is not enough. They are gonna be overwhelmed with cases. Let's support them and make sure they have the infrastructure to do it. And if we're rolling out programs for our families and our survivors, don't take them away from us. If you've implemented something and it's working in our communities, back it, fund it, do everything you can to make sure it's maintained. Like I think about VOCA being cut right now by 40%. These are lifelines for our community members. These are recommendations that were uplifted within the work of the commission. And I hope, I just wanted to say on behalf of one of our uh, Alaska relatives and Commissioner Vivian, let this be the spark let this report be the spark that ignites a movement of Thank healing, you. that decade of action, of healing and action for our communities that's needed. And wouldn't it be amazing, she said, if every single tribal leader signed on to support these recommendations. So that's my <laughs> challenge to you, to answer her call, to answer Thank our you. relative's call. And I just wanted to say, well, Wannan, it was an honor to do this work, and it's an Thank honor you. to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we will go to Councilman Williams now um, and appreciate it if we could stay within the four minutes so that we have time for everyone to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable, Sec Honorable Secretary of Holland. My name is Philip Williams of the Yurok Tribe. Listen to all you fellow panelists, you know, got me emotional. You know, um, the Non-Invisible Commission, when they came to town, uh, it gave us hope. It gave us hope that somebody's listening and that somebody cares. Uh, you know, growing up in a community where our own trustee, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, was beating our heads up, fighting us over fish wars, keeping us from exercising our rights. 
Not a visible commission came and heard our stories and heard our communities pour their hearts out. I myself was able to provide a testimony. My whole life has been tra traumatic. And it goes all the way from my ancestors. It goes to my great-great-grandmother, who was born in 1865. And in her lifetime, she was not able to go out and gather traditional foods because she would be raped or beaten by soldiers. That goes all the way back up to where we are now. In 2015, I lost my own daughter. And I identify with all the hurt and the pain that all these other families go through. Because we're in a rural environment where we'll never know the answers of what happened to our, our loved ones. This gave us hope to families that are still dealing with that trauma of wondering what happened to their, their family member. Um, it wasn't just you know, women either. I have best friends of mine that were murdered. Mm -hmm. People that I've known my whole life. I'm 56 years old and I've had a lifetime of loss. All the way going back to high school. Nobody cared. It all gets dropped, pushed, and forgotten. But the families don't forget. We don't forget. The Not Invisible Commission gave us opportunity. We don't really know if it's going to move forward, to be truthful with you. But we hope that it does. I hope that the research and the data that was accumulated is not put on a shelf in one of these buildings here and collected dust and forgotten about. If you ask for my recommendations, I, I'd ask you, Secretary Holland, to keep this alive, because we can't solve this in one year, three years, or five years. This fight is so great, it's going to take generations to heal the wounds for our people. I have a hope. The reason I'm here today is because I have grandchildren that I want to be healed. I want to have a healthy life. And so I continue this fight for all Indian people, the Yurok people, um, and I use my heart. Walk loud. Thank you. Thank you so very much. And before we transition to our next question, I just want to offer a heartfelt thank you to all the uh, commissioners of NIAC who spent their time and effort traveling around, meeting together, coming up with all of the recommendations for the report. I know that some of these conversations were um, sad and and really heart wrenching, and so I just appreciate your sacrifice and everything you did to make this a reality. Thank you. Uh, question two is for our federal panelists. Again, I'd like to ask that you speak for four minutes, and I understand that there is a timer there on the stage. So if you could uh, glance at that every now and then, that would be great. We just heard from the NIAC commissioners about their experience, experiences with the Not Invisible Act Commission and the expectations for the recommendations in the report. How is your office planning to engage the substance of the report and leverage the report's insights? And we will first turn to U.S. Attorney Ramsdale um, for the answer. Thank you, Secretary Holland, and thank you for inviting the U.S. Attorney community to be part of this conversation. It has long been a priority of the Department <clears throat> of Justice to address the disproportionately high rates of violence experienced by American Indians and Alaskan Natives, and relatedly, the high rates at which indigenous persons go missing. As the NIAC report underscores, there is a crisis of violence and abuse in Indian country and the department is committed to working with NIAC to address that crisis with the urgency it demands. But what does it look like on the front lines at the U.S. Attorney's Office? 
As the chair of the Attorney General's Native American Issues Subcommittee, which is comprised of US attorneys across the country who deal with Indian country, I can tell you we've spent a great deal of time with this 210-page report. We reviewed it, we've discussed the recommendations, and we're working on a response. As these conversations evolve, specifically as they relate to the US attorney community, we see the recommendations falling into three categories. First, there are recommendations about existing resources that can be leveraged, and we wholeheartedly agree with these recommendations. Some examples include increasing the use of special assistant U.S. attorneys from tribal communities, uh, using cross-deputization agreements, and utilizing state forensic laboratories to expedite criminal investigations. We recognize that no single entity can keep tribal communities safe, and so we back leveraging these existing resources as force multipliers in community safety. Second, there are recommendations that relate to existing programs, and we are committed to expanding those programs and refining those programs. I think the first of these is training. We have the National Indian Country Training Initiative within the Department of Justice. It's a robust training program committed to meeting the needs of those of us in the field and doing so in a manner that's accessible to our tribal partners and others out in the community. In the past year alone, this institute, which we call NICD, organized 25 separate trainings on violence against women and children and issues related to MMIP. The department's also implementing a strategy to educate the public about NamUs, including outreach to tribal organizations about how to use NamUs effectively. These trainings are free of charge to federal, local, and state criminal justice entities, to social service organizations, to medical personnel, and to tribal leaders. And NICD will continue to expand these programs in response to the NIAC report. There's also the MMIP Regional Outreach Program, which Ms. Welch referenced. In June of this year, the department announced the creation of this program, which permanently places attorneys and coordinators throughout the country in five separate regions. The U.S. attorney community supports this program, and we will leverage these AUSAs and coordinators to assist in resolving cases where federal jurisdiction exists and bridging gaps in communication. Other notable programs, which I'll talk about later, include the Savannah's Act guidelines and tribal community response plans. Finally, the third bucket, there are recommendations that were new to us, but fall squarely within our area of expertise. And I think we can roll these out locally pretty quickly. And, and things that come to mind include um, establishing regular multidisciplinary team meetings to address missing persons, expanding tribal prosecutor training to include court personnel, and developing a community awareness program where we go into the community and, and educate about the federal criminal justice system, specifically about violent crime and murder and human trafficking. So we look forward to evaluating the utility and feasibility of these recommendations and others alongside our federal partners, and we seek input from all of you who've read the report on which recommendations are most meaningful to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, U.S. Attorney Ramsdale. We'll now move to Director Hidalgo. Good morning, and thank you so much, Secretary Holland, for your vision and leadership in implementing the Not Invisible Act Commission and, and in collaboration with the Attorney General Merrick Garland. OVW's Principal Deputy Director was one of six representatives from DOJ on the NIAC, and we are so grateful for the tremendous dedication of the commissioners, not only those on the stage, but all the others who participated and tribal leaders and others who gave testimony, including survivors and families, and coming together to really acknowledge, as we all have said, that this demands urgent action and prioritization. And part of receiving that NIAC report, the Department of Justice has 90 days, along with the Department of the Interior, to issue our response to that. And we are hard at work, as, as uh, the U.S. Attorney here has mentioned, in really compiling how best to continue to expand on these commitments and dedication to addressing this. I'm honored to serve as the Director of the Office on Violence Against Women at the U.S. Department of Justice and implement the Violence Against Women Act, which the Secretary referenced, critical legislation that's our nation's commitment to preventing and addressing sexual assault, domestic violence, dating violence, stalking, and other interconnected forms of gender-based violence, including sex trafficking. 
And so the work that we do to implement VAWA really focuses in three main areas. One is getting out critical resources through grants out to communities. And as you mentioned, it's getting those resources in the hands of those who best know how to do this work. And it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. The second way is through national training and technical assistance. And third is through advancing policies. So real quickly on our grants, we have more than 20 grants, but there are some specifically focused, as you all know, on getting these resources to tribal communities through our tribal governments program, our tribal sexual assault services program, our special tribal criminal jurisdiction grant program, and also funding some of the tribal special assistant U.S. attorneys. So um, this year, fiscal year 2023, we were able to issue historic amounts of VAWA funding, which increased over 30% under, under this administration. And of the 633 million that was you know, put out there for communities to do this work, 68 million specifically went to support tribal communities in doing this work to address these issues with American Indian and Alaska Native uh, communities and all the grant programs also. We wanna to continue to support that access. We have an amazing tribal affairs division that when I last worked at OVW in the Obama administration, there were four individuals, now it's 14, and growing, and hiring, hiring tremendous advocates from tribal communities to be part of that team, including two in Alaska, to continue to support the tribes, to access these resources, to have the flexibility, and to do the work as you all best know how to do, rooted in culturally appropriate practices and traditions of healing, of safety, and justice. And real quickly, every time VAWA gets reauthorized, it's an opportunity to strengthen those protections. And it's thanks to the tremendous leadership of tribal advocates, tribal leaders, that VAWA 2013 included provisions affirming and recognizing inherent authority of tribes to have special tribal criminal jurisdiction in cases of domestic violence and dating violence. And also, again, through the leadership of tribal leaders and advocates in VAWA in 2022, when it was reauthorized, it's expanded recognition of that inherent authority, including in cases of sexual assault, stalking, sex trafficking, when non-native perpetrators of this abuse are the ones who cause these harms in Indian country and holding them accountable. So we are really grateful for all the ways in which the leadership of tribes, including through our annual government-to-government -government tribal consultation that's so key for OVW to implement and support and work in partnership with all of you. We had the opportunity, uh, when I first started as the director in August, I had the opportunity to go to the tribal consultation that was hosted by Muscogee Creek Nation in Oklahoma. And uh, in 2024, it'll be in New Mexico. And we want to continue to support all of you. And real quickly, and I know my time, and Secretary, I respect that, real quickly, I want to announce that one of the new programs that we are going to be putting out our notice of a new funding opportunity from VAWA 2022 to get federal reimbursement for the implementation of special tribal criminal jurisdiction, as well as um, advancing a lot of this work with Alaska Native Villages and rolling out pilot programs there as well. So thank you for your leadership, for your tremendous partnership, and we look forward to continuing to strengthen that. Thank you very much, Director Hidalgo. We'll now move to Executive Assistant Director Langan. Thank you, ma'am. So the FBI, we continue to look to improve how we investigate and bring justice to tribal communities. And I'll talk about three separate areas that uh, we look to, to work on. One, collaboration, resources, and our operations. So as far as collaboration goes, uh, one of our main pipelines of investigative actions is through our Safe Trails Task Forces. We have over 25 Safe Trail Task Forces. And this includes uh, over 550 task force officers that are embedded with our task forces from tribal communities, from BIA, working together to investigate uh, crimes. Uh, and with that, we're looking to increase our partnership with BIA. We've now embedded a BIA analyst directly with our Indian Country Unit at headquarters. And what this will help do is develop our strategy and resource implementation uh, directly where it's most needed with communications back in FBI headquarters uh, and so we really look for that to be an increased collaboration. As far as resources goes, this, this was, in 2023 was the largest resource increase to Indian country that the FBI has ever seen. We increased our resources by approximately 25%. It's larger than any other program percentage-wise that we increased. So there was some significant efforts made in, in the last years um, trying to bring justice to tribal communities and engagement with the FBI. Um, and then to wrap it up with the operations, right? That's really where the rubber meets the road. 
what are we doing? And one of our operations is Operation Not Forgotten. And what, what the Bureau did was looked at uh, multiple cases, cold cases involving murdered individuals, missing people, um, assaults, uh, crimes against children. And what we did was we connected uh, 200 different investigations. These are cold investigations that didn't have leads. We surged resources to 10 field offices to try to make some headway on these cases. And this initiative started in just July of this year, in 2023. And just since then, we've been able to conduct uh, 40 uh, arrest search operations. We identified four children that had previously been unidentified, uh, four unfortunate victim child, um, child of uh, violence. And we also located one missing child, so just since July. So that kind of sums up the, those three buckets from the FBI. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, next question is for Judge Demmer and Sergeant Windy Boy. As I mentioned, we are running short of time, so I would appreciate you staying within the time allowance, uh, which is three minutes now. Uh, given the critical importance of strong tribal jurisdiction and effective and appropriate cooperation among local and federal authorities, I'd like to ask Judge Demmert and Sergeant Windy Boy about the role of tribal jurisdiction and any recommendations on how the federal government can help reinforce tribal jurisdiction. We'll go first to you, Judge Demmert. Uh, goodness, Chish. So I've been an attorney and a tribal court judge in Washington, Oregon, or well, an attorney in Washington and Alaska, but a tribal court judge in Washington, Oregon, Alaska, and California for nearly 30 years, and jurisdiction continues to befuddle our tribal, uh, our federal and state partners. And with all due respect, Director, um, Deputy Director, when we asked the FBI to come speak at the Not Invisible Act Commission, they, they, they didn't see the point of it because they didn't have jurisdiction in our 229 Alaska Native communities. And so a lot of these things sound good, but they have no meaning for us if we don't meet the definition of Indian country. So let's hold these individuals accountable. Nothing personal, but it's just really emotional for me to hear about all these things that are available, but not available in Alaska. So anyway, uh, jurisdiction. I'm gonna give you some talking points, and I hope that you take these two agencies and your Congress. Mm -hmm. Let's remove jurisdictional restrictions. VAWA made huge impact and positive changes. Let's continue that. We finally have some movement in Alaska, but we need some help and resources there. Congress must enact legislation addressing the Castro Huerto decision. Justice Gorsuch dissent outlined one possible approach. Let's see that through. We need to move towards recognizing full tribal criminal jurisdiction. It, our, ch our children, our families, our women are unsafe because we do not have full tribal jurisdiction. And until that day happens, we're gonna see perpetrators prey on us because they know that they will not be held accountable. Let's get rid of those barriers. Public Law 280 is a policy that undermines public safety and is a front to tribal sovereignty in the federal tribal relationship. Tribes located in public law, 280 states have been shut out, shut out of compact public safety and justice funding. We get none. As for Alaska, the administration programs in all statutory language should be amended to include Alaska villages. When you use the term Indian country, it excludes us. We matter. We need to be included to every program that is mentioned. <laughs> Introduce and pass the Honoring Tribal Nations Act introduced by Warren and Kilmer last session. For true healing, we need to have the Truth and Healing Commission on Indian boarding schools passed. The MMIP crisis, increased violence, lack of jurisdiction is all interconnected. Deborah Parker this morning just mentioned to me that they found records in the 1850s of our little girls being murdered and, and or being sent away for uh, disciplinary matters and, being, and going missing. That's just, I mean, 
the generations of pain that we have. Finally, we need the federal government to respond and implement the Non-Invisible Act Commission recommendations in a timely manner. That's Thank what you. the decade of action and healing is all about. We Thank cannot you. just have this one moment in time. We need to move on, like Thank our you. chair said. Thank you, goodness Thank Jesus. you, Judge Demmer. Thank you very much. We'll move to Sergeant Lynn Rupor. Thank you, Secretary. So the area that I cover, um, I'm a non-mandatory PL 280 state. So I have a checkerboard jurisdiction and it gets confusing at times, even after we went through retrocession. There's, there's so much area that I cover and I am still cut off from the rest of my officers. I work along the sheriff's office, I work alongside with state patrol and the city officers. The tribal police officers are, we barely got computers. We're still cut off from the rest of the state jurisdictions. Our internet service is very patchy, I guess. It comes and goes. Um, it'd be nice to have the cross jurisdiction coverage between all the agencies, just because I, I don't know what's going on. Um, I was, I'll just share that I, I was T-boned by a drunk driver in an intersection, and it took a long time for my assistants to get to me. I, they didn't know where I was. They didn't know what happened. Mm -hmm. All they knew is that I was hit by a car, and uh, I was upside down. So I really hope that at one point that the tribal police are able to get coverage when it comes to broad brand coverage, when it comes to anything in our patrol cars, and being able to communicate with the surrounding jurisdictions. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Sergeant Linda Boy. That's not too much to ask for. Thank you. Um, question four is for U.S. Attorney Ramsdell and Executive Assistant Director Langan. You have three minutes each. In what ways have U.S. Attorney and the Federal Bureau of Investigation partnered with tribes to address the MMIP crisis? We'll go first to U.S. Attorney General Ramsdell. Thank you. Well, at the heart of what we do at the U.S. Attorney's Office is prosecute federal crime. That's our duty. And so I want to share a quick example with you from the MMIP Regional Outreach Program, that new program uh, in the Great Plains region, which is South Dakota. And Nebraska, North Dakota, Wyoming, and Alaska. Um, we have an AUSA appointed to this work, and last month he achieved a resolution in a case from 1992 involving the murder of an 18-month-old girl. He did this alongside a tribal police officer and an FBI agent who got a tip, and they ran it down. They reinvestigated. They got an expert analysis, and they elicited a confession to voluntary manslaughter. That's the success of our prosecutions. That's, like I said, the core of what we do with our tribal partners to be responsive to crimes that are happening, whether it be immediately or over time. In the Department of Justice, cold cases are not closed cases, and we'll continue to work those matters. I mentioned earlier that I talk about the Savannah's Act guidelines. That's something we're doing with our tribal partners to address the MMIP crisis, whether um, the, our districts have jurisdiction in Indian country or PL-280 states. All U.S. attorney's offices worked to implement Savannah's Act guidelines in the spring of 2022. And those are guidelines that talk about the cooperation between law enforcement in cases of missing uh, persons. They set forth best practices in conducting searches, the standards for collecting and analyzing data and human remains, and ensuring access to culturally appropriate victim services. Again, those were um, issued in 2022, and we are committed year after year to going in and updating those so that they are responsive. Related to that are tribal community response plans. Those are plans that um, internally tribes can create to respond to missing persons. We support this work, but importantly, it's, it's led by tribes. We want your plans to be responsive to your community needs, to incorporate your cultural considerations, and so we come alongside you at your invite uh, to develop these tribal community response plans. And then I think what's so meaningful about the work we do in the U.S. Attorney's offices are the opportunities we have for outreach. Um, we've come alongside tribes to help 
do simple things like put photos in these missing person databases so that these cases are more than names. Um, talking with your youth about the precursors, the vulnerabilities of becoming a missing person, right? Drug use, being reckless on social media. And we're happy to come out and engage in, in speaking um, opportunities or going mm -hmm. on MMIP awareness walks, anything we can do to come alongside tribes and raise awareness on this crisis. Um, we look forward to continuing this conversation and we invite any of your thoughts in our individual districts. Thank you. Thank you, U.S. Attorney Ramsdale. I didn't mean to give you a promotion during this <laughs> panel, but thank you. Um, and we will move to Executive Assistant Director Lankin next. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I, I, collaboration is a key for us, whether it's a formal relationships from our Safe Trails Task Forces or informal partnerships with tribal mm -hmm. police uh, in, in any area. I think that's where we spend a lot of our, our, our time trying to improve our operations. Um, one area is multidisciplinary teams where we, we found that if we combine the investigators, both at the state, local, tribal, federal level, uh, combine them with, with the prosecutors involved, with family services, with victim services, and we look at these um, problems, we look at cases in a holistic approach, it, it ends up yielding a much better result and in, in it makes sure that we're inclusive of, of all the victims and when trying to bring justice to, to crime. So that's one area, this multidisciplinary approach that hopefully we'll see some increased benefits there. Um, as we've mentioned on, on the panel too, uh, data, you know, data is, is a huge complex problem. Uh, it's a problem in the government in general, but, but it definitely affects uh, tribal communities. And trying to make sure that we've got the correct timely data on, on missing individuals and individuals that may have been victims of crime. So we're working ex uh, very closely with tribal communities. There's, there's two initiatives that we're leading, one out of Albuquerque, one in Phoenix, where we're helping the communities identify, collect that data, make sure the data is in a usable, appropriate, manner to where we can distribute leads appropriately to other states, other offices, to try to attempt to, to bring justice to, to some families. And then I think joint training is always, is always a key to make sure that we're operating on a, on a baseline, a similar level. So we, we have a joint training initiative. It's a two-week basic violent crime in, uh, for, for tribal communities where we help officers, prosecutors, uh, tribal police uh, learn the basics of, of crime scene management, of, of uh, shooting investigations, of crimes against children, and, and to try to help them better implement the tools that we can try to provide to, the, to uh, tribal communities and, and uh, engage more effective manner, to, again, to bring justice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have one last question, and we're going to try to fit it in. Um, we heard many times about the importance of healing and victim services in the fight against MMIP, including preventative measures for violence. Uh, I'm going to direct this question to Councilman Williams and Director Hidalgo. Uh, could you comment on the importance of victim services, healing programs, and preventative measures? Councilman Williams, uh, you have about two and a half minutes. <laughs> Thank you. You know, we, uh, fortunately, we have uh, our Honorable Judge Abby Abenanti, who's spearheading our, our restorative justice project. And she's identified one of the leading uh, things that, to MMIP is mental health. And um, we're working on, on MOUs with our local law enforcement officers. Our jails have been used as mental institutions, uh, and, and they're not equipped. And so we're trying to create culturally-based victim services uh, where we have, uh, in the works, we're creating a wellness facility. If some of you know where we live at in Northern California, we live in some of the most beautiful parts of California. And we know that our area will heal the people, along with our culture. Uh, thankful to uh, Governor Newsom, Attorney General Bonta, uh, uh, giving us the, the, the money to create this facility. We also know that on our next phase is outpatient facility. 
And outpatient mm-hmm. facilities can be some of the most effective ways to, to get to the people that are hurting. The reason they're, they're missing or murdered is because they, they're undervalued. The, the communities do not value people with mental illness, including our own communities. And I want to uh, speak to the tribal leaders in this room. You have people in your communities that are homeless, that are addicted to drugs, that are down there on the street asking for money. We've got to quit shunning them. We need to bring them in. We need to help them with the love and compassion we have for one another. I do this regularly. I go through the homeless encampments, searching for our people, looking for ways to get them out of there. We're looking at the homeless encampments now as a concentration where we can actually put our program managers, our caseworkers, in those encampments to work them because they're already there concentrated. So we're looking at ways to work with what we have right now. The outpatient facility has a lot of hope for us where we can administer the medications, we can give them telehealth services, we can feed them, we can take care of their health needs, we can give them culture, we can teach them uh, uh, all the things they need to overcome the hardships of this life. And that's what we're missing is nobody's teaching that this life is hard. It's hard to be in this system we're in now as a Native person. And sometimes you give up because it's too hard. But we have to continue to prop those people up, people that I love, my cousins, my family, my sisters, my brothers. They have value in this community, and we need to uplift them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Councilman Williams. We'll go to Director Hidalgo. You have about two and a half minutes. Great. <clears throat> Thank you so much. You know, I think as we listen to these statistics that with, you know, and we recognize the urgency, it can seem overwhelming, and yet we know that those statistics don't define tribal communities. We know how important it is to support that strengths-based approach. And we know that individual incidents of domestic violence, of sexual assault, are not just isolated, solitary events. They do reflect, over time, the systemic and institutional failures. They do reflect intergenerational and historic trauma. And so I think it is a moment, as you've mentioned, for all of us to come together to look more holistically of how do we get to root causes. And to your point, you know, Secretary, with your question, how do we also look at healing? How do we look at safety, justice, and healing as so crucial? Uh, we had the opportunity in this administration to launch our first ever national plan to end gender-based violence and really talked about the need for a public health and a public safety approach and how we're doing those kinds of, of, of you know, victim services. And through our tribal consultations, for example, something we recently heard was as people are bringing forth children who are victims of sexual abuse, there are adults disclosing that they are adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse who never received the support, the opportunities for healing. And so we're looking at exploring ways to strengthen and provide victim services to adults when people are bringing forward children who are impacted. We also are hearing the need to fund more of the behavioral health, mental health services that are so crucial in a much more holistic approach. So those are things that we're very committed to. Also through OVCs, Tribal Victim Services Set Aside, they also have been making those funds more flexible to help families access additional resources for mental health and healing for families impacted when loved ones, when relatives are, are missing or murdered. And so how we can continue, you know, to your point, to expand access to resources to look at these issues more holistically. Also, through the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act uh, just last year, for the first time in VAWA, there is now funding for restorative practices programs. And we know a lot of those traditions are rooted in, uh, in tribal communities, and it's an opportunity through these resources to fund also a, a wider range of access to justice as people may define that. We wanna to continue to make sure that for those seeking justice in the criminal justice system that we continue to expand that, but we know we need multiple pathways to how people define justice and how some restorative programs can also work with those who cause harm and with those who've been harmed in other ways working towards healing and accountability in communities. So we look forward to in partnership with you all as we roll out uh, those programs. And then also finally real quickly, some of our resources, for example, we recently funded two Alaska Native villages, $1.5 million each for a five-year period of time 
to really begin to more holistically develop the kinds of programs we need. So again, we look forward to this continued uh, partnership to do this work in, in this more expansive manner. Thank so thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Director Hidalgo. And th I, again, thank all of you so much for your service to our country, for this thoughtful discussion. I'm sorry that we do not have time for audience Q&A on this panel. Please know that our doors here will always be open to you. Um, we also have my amazing staff who you'll see. Uh, I know all of you know Heidi Todicini, who worked very hard on the, on the Not Invisible Act Commission. Uh, when you see her, you can ask her questions. You can ask my other uh, staff questions. They'll be with you at lunch as well. Thank you all again so much, and I look forward to continuing these important conversations.